Hello everyone, welcome back to GG, and this is part 3, the final part for today, Tuesday, November 13th, 2012. All the headlines and links will be posted in YouTube's video description, so you can go check those out. Alright, we left off with this, um, this little policy uh, report here, talking about Israel, and you know, why does Israel do what they do? You know, a clean break, a new strategy for securing the realm, it's, it's basically a policy document prepared in 1996 by a study group. Uh, for Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister. So, and remember, one of them was including, uh, included the removal of Saddam Hussein from Iraq. But also an aggressive policy that advocated the use of proxy armies for regime changes, basically destabilizing to advance right-wing Zionism. So it goes on here, and it says that an October 2003 editorial in The Nation criticized the Syria Accountability Act and connected it to the Clean Break Report and its authors, it says to understand the Syria Accountability Act, you have to go to this document, A Clean Break. It says in there, uh, Syria challenges Israel on Lebanese soil, they wrote, calling for striking Syrian military targets in Lebanon, and should that prove inefficient or insufficient, striking at select targets in Syria proper. It says, no wonder Pearl was delighted by the Israeli strike. It will help the peace process, he told the Washington Post. Adding later that the U.S. itself might have to attack Syria. Remember, they don't want peace. That's what we were just talking about. But what Pearl means by helping the peace process is not resolving the conflict by bringing about a viable sovereign Palestinian state, but rather an underscored, as underscored in a clean break, transcending the Arab-Israeli conflict altogether by forcing the Arabs to accept most, if not all, of Israel's territorial conquests and expansions, of course, and its nuclear hegemony in the region. Then we have, despite U.S. warnings and Israeli threats, Abbas vows to go forward with U.N. recognition. The EU reportedly split down the middle on the issue. Israeli officials are continuing to reiterate their threats to withhold Palestinian tax money if they are recognized by the United Nations. Well, uh, President Obama made a call to Palestine president, warning him against going forward with recognition as a non-member state. It says it's likely to be a landslide victory, with the non-aligned movement having endorsed the plan. But a large number of the remaining 15 members of the EU may simply not vote at all as a compromise between rejecting Palestinian recognition and placating the U.S. Along with that other um, uh, Wikipedia uh, story on the clean break, I came across this too, playing Skittles with Saddam, the game plan among Washington's hawks or neocons, Christian Zionists have long been to reshape the Middle East along with U.S.-Israeli lines. Remember, this is from 2002. This is pretty interesting. Before the invasion of Iraq, after um, Saddam uh, introduced or proposed trading uh, oil in euros, it said uh, that uh, President, well, now he's ousted, right? Uh, Mubarak of Egypt predicted devastating consequences for the Middle East if Iraq was attacked. And, of course, this writer in The Guardian in the U.K. and that, they, uh, they basically make fun out of him, saying he's an old-fashioned kind of Arab. In this brave new uh, post-September 11th world, he doesn't quite get the point. So they're saying that um, in the Pentagon, they're probably laughing at him. Uh, but they do agree on one thing, and that is it could spell disaster for several regimes in the Middle East. So uh, Egypt's Mubarak believed that that would be bad, but the neocons thought it would be good. They said that... Uh, disorder and chaos sweeping through the region would not be an unfortunate side effect of war with Iraq, but a sign that everything is going according to plan. In their eyes, Iraq is just a starting point, or a recent presentation at the Pentagon put it, a tactical pivot for remolding the Middle East on Israeli-American lines. Of course, now they're trying to pivot towards Asia. And just like uh, General Wesley Clark said, you know, just a list of, of all the countries that were to go down, uh, you know, Iraq and uh, Afghanistan and uh, Libya and Syria and Lebanon and Iran. So they're basically talking about what we just talked about with the clean break document. It says, this reverses the usual approach in international relations where stability is seen as a key to peace. Whether or not you like your neighbors, you have to find ways of living with them. But these neocons and Zionists say, no. They say, if you don't like neighbors, get rid of them. Next up, Mossad tried to kill Saddam in 1970s, Israeli documentary says. A new documentary reveals that uh, Israelis 
Intelligence agency Mossad tried to assassinate the former Iraqi ruler Saddam Hussein in the 1970s by a bomb hidden in a book. Most Americans oppose Israel's attack on Iran, says a survey. They believe that Washington should discourage Israel from attacking Iran's nuclear facilities. It was 737 people. It says 63% of them believe that the U.S. should discourage Israel from attacking Iran, while 33% said the U.S. should encourage Israel to attack Iran's nuclear program. They were also asked about the outcome of an Israeli strike on Iran by giving their opinion. They said 70% of the respondents said Iran would attack U.S. bases in the region and drag the U.S. into a new war. 23% maintained that Iran was not probable to engage the U.S. Egyptian protesters demand an end to uh, ties with Israel. It's not going to happen, of course, because they have their um, Western puppet over there. So, not going to happen. Uh, so a report says Iran believes U.S. drone was spying on oil tankers. Iran's Revolutionary Guard commander tells the semi-official Marist News Agency that the U.S. drone was gathering economic information on oil tankers and warns that Tehran will react if the incident happens again. So, Also, you have Iran claiming it has proof the U.S. drone invaded airspace. They said it came after the Pentagon, says Iran fired on a U.S. drone in international airspace. So they said that uh, Iran was aware of international law regarding incursions from alien aircraft. Certainly, they said in a quote, if the situation had been otherwise, we would have never have fired at the drone. And then Iran's Jews. Iran's problem with Israel is its government and policies and not its people. So despite the U.S. and Israel openly subverting, encircling and unleashing terrorists and threatening war upon Iran, the nation both its government and its people hold a balanced view towards the people living under the governments threatening them. Because of the torrent propaganda washing over the audiences, many of them may be surprised at the conditions under which Iran's Jewish community live, the largest population of Jews in the Middle East outside Israel, surprised that they have representation in the government, protections, and an ancient thriving culture. And there's a YouTube video. You can go in there. The link will be posted. Uh, it says, Journeyman Pictures takes us into a community and offers us an alternative view of not only Iran's position towards Judaism in the world, but insight into the insidious, manipulative deceit of Western governments, including their Middle East client regime Israel. Next up, now it's payback time, why Obama should bust Netanyahu for 9-11. Since all observers admitted that Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu did everything in his power to destroy Obama's political career. He should destroy Netanyahu's career in the biggest, most spectacular way possible by busting Netanyahu for 9-11. It goes on here, it says, After all, the Rothschild family, the biggest of the eight families, created Israel as its base of criminal operations. Even mainstream historians admit that Lord Rothschild created Israel in 1917 by handing the British an offer they couldn't refuse. We can win World War I for you by dragging America into the war, but in return you must give us Palestine. American strategist Zygmunt Brzezinski in his book in 1999, The Grand Chessboard, pointed out the most important single element of a viable U.S. strategy in Eurasia is friendship with Iran. What he did not outright but left for the discerning reader to discover between the lines is that Israel is badly damaging U.S. national interests by forcing the U.S. to be an enemy of Iran. Israel hates Iran because Iran's leaders like the majority of them in the Middle East, do not accept apartheid Israel as a legitimate state. Goes on here, says, why is the U.S. starving the Iranian people, murdering Iranian scientists, paying MEK terrorists to bomb and kill large numbers of innocent people, and generally doing everything it can to hurt Iran? The short answer, because Israeli interests dictate U.S. Mideast policy. Then the global energy axis, Iran to build oil reservoirs, refineries in Venezuela, Iran and uh, Venezuela agreed on Monday to build some oil reserves and refineries in the Latin American country. They're also planning to deliver domestically made oil tankers to Venezuela. They're going to have four um, total. U.S. to overtake Saudi Arabia as top oil producer. They said they're going to overtake Saudi Arabia and Russia to become the world's largest global oil producer by 2017. However, other analysts have warned that the U.S. oil boom is still in its infancy and continued growth to the levels predicted by the IEA cannot be guaranteed. And something interesting I came across, Iran's foreign minister calls for closer economic relations with Iraq's Kyrgyzstan regional government. They say the Islamic Republic is in favor of negotiations between the Syrian government and opposition groups to create stability in the Middle Eastern country. 
but also they want to have economic cooperation between Iran and uh, Iraq's Kurdistan regional government. Also found this, Turkey preparing major Kurdistan oil entry. A new Turkish state oil and gas company is negotiating with Iraq's uh, Kurdistan region to take stakes in several explore exploration blocks, a development that would signal dramatic headway for the Kurds in their quest for oil sector autonomy. No contracts have been signed. And you have Iraq's president calling for closer Iran-Kurdistan uh, economic ties. So Iraqi president has called for closer economic cooperation between the Islamic Republic and Iraq's Kurdistan. So this is all within the past few days. Uh, but this isn't. This is from October 23rd. Kurdistan begins oil exports defying Baghdad, the central government. Kurdish oil sold in international markets via power trans. Baghdad says it alone has the right to control Iraq oil and gas. So it says that Kurdistan has 30% of Iraq's oil reserve. Also, besides selling it cheaper, there's a concern that uh, Kurdistan gives most of the profits to the oil companies. They ask, is this a bad thing? And they say, no. They say most oil-rich countries can develop their economy considerably if they use what they have correctly. So I don't know about that. That's why I said uh, the reason I'm covering Kurdistan is because there's a good chance that they're going to come and get their own independent state, although they're going to be kind of a proxy for, for the West and the Zionists. But it's starting to look like this is taking shape. <clears throat> it says here, Kurdistan, you know, and that's the thing with Libya, you know, the profits may have went to social services and really did help to make Libya one of the most modern uh, countries uh, in Africa. But that last article saying, no, just go ahead and give all your profits and everything to the oil companies like British Petroleum and Royal Dutch Shell. Kurd Kurdistan denies contract to buy helicopters from France. So uh, one of the representatives denied that Kurdistan has signed a contract with France to buy helicopters. They say it's a statement made by politicians as propaganda could lead to problems between the central government and provincial government. Then you have Russia asked Iraq to renegotiate on the arms deal. I saw something about Iraq buying a bunch of U.S.-made arms, and then all of a sudden this Russia deal that fell through came out in the media. Uh, Maliki had signed during his recent visit to Moscow a Russian arms deal worth $4 billion, including attack helicopters and surface-to-air missiles. I'm sure he's getting pressured by the West. Iraq pressures Russia's Gazprom to quit Kurdistan. The Iraqi central government has told the Russian energy giant Gazprom to give up oil deals in Kurdistan or face losing a lucrative oil field contract or maybe arms deal too. That was from November 9th. Then the 2,000 people are marching in London in support of Kurdish hunger strikes in Turkey. So they're large, uh, marching in solidarity with the Kurdish hunger strikes in Turkish prisons, which have reached their 61st day. So this is pretty interesting here now. Is this is this the Zionists uh, co-opting the victims of the oppressed uh, minority? Ex-chief of Iraq's central bank says his sudden removal was government effort to seize control. Many so they're saying that uh, Mal Maliki is trying to grab control of the country's independent institutions. They call them independent. The constitution of Iraq states that the central bank is financially and administratively independent institution that reports to the Council and Representatives of Iraq. Sounds like the private Federal Reserve reporting to Congress, right? In the year 2000, there were seven countries without a Rothschild-owned central bank. Afghanistan, Iraq, Sudan, Libya, Cuba, North Korea, and Iran. Only three countries left without Rothschild's central bank. So it's giving them an incredible amount of wealth and power. So that's what this thing is, the 2004. In other words, prior to the invasion, they had their own central bank and their sovereignty. After the invasion, after Saddam threatened to start trading oil in euros, they got invaded and the central bank became privatized. I'm sorry, independent. That's if I understand that correctly. You know, if I'm wrong, correct me, please. Iraq needs $1 trillion to rebuild, investment head says. They said that they need about $1 trillion over the next two, 10 years to rebuild its crumbling infrastructure and battered economy. The energy sector accounts for two-thirds of the GDP of Iraq, but only 1% of employment, so joblessness is often cited as a complaint by Iraqi. France is to release $2 billion of Libya frozen assets, so that's nice of them, isn't it? But fell short of referring to the rest of the funds, which was up to 100 Big surprise. Neither Hillary Clinton or Petraeus will testify at the Benghazi hearings. What's the big secret of the emails? Well, that the U.S. Was, and CIA was arming terrorists and al-Qaeda going into Libya and Syria. African nations agreed to invade Mali to save them from Islamist control, even though they're trying to 
you know, have peace talks and that. And that West Africa commits 3,300 troops to the Mali invasion. Remember France and U.S. is waiting on the green light from Algeria? Oh, Algerian military plane crashes, and now their troops are moving. Thank you.